severed. Uh, when I was, I don't know how old I was, 15 maybe, uh, I had a dirt bike, and my friend Jeff, who I bought my dirt bike from, because uh, his dad got him a new one, and so I bought his, and we used to race in this field uh, probably half a mile from our house. And one day Jeff was ahead of me, and he went around this kind of a blind curve because it was a huge pile of uh, growth of berry bushes, blackberries, and, and it was a third gear corner. We didn't have speedometers on our dirt bikes, but we just went by, what gear are you in? So he disappears around this bend, standing up on his pegs in third gear, wide open, and when I come around right behind him, all there's just dust flying everywhere and people flying everywhere, and there was uh, a gal who was coming the opposite direction, put putting along on a, a big uh, street bike, and she panicked and turned sideways in front of him, and he T-boned her, and... Anyway, he's flying about. So he's getting up, and, and I'm going, Jeff, 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 are you all right? And he goes, yeah, kind of. And his middle finger was missing, most of it. And uh, so it was severed, probably by his clutch handle, I think. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, it severed his finger. We went looking for it to try to get it sewed back on, but we never could find it. And uh, that's, that's, when things are severed, that's pretty permanent, you know? So by way of introduction, what, what makes the book of Acts the book of Acts? Well, it's called the Acts of the Apostles, or it's action. The book of Acts is the book of Acts because it's action. It's the church in action. And when you start down through the book of Acts, you see a lot of action, you know, and, uh, Chapter 2, they're all baptized in the Holy Spirit, 120 of them. And in chapter 3, a lame man is healed uh, at the gate of the temple. In chapter 5, there's a Holy Ghost jailbreak. In chapter 6, Stephen's doing great wonders and signs. In chapter 8, Philip goes down to Samaria and preaches Christ. People are saved and healed and delivered from all kinds of things. Uh, in chapter 10, Peter is summoned to Cornelius' house and he preaches the gospel there and the Holy Spirit falls on everybody that's there. And by the time you get to chapter 17, these, the, these Christians, the, the New Testament church, uh, gets a label of those that have turned the world upside down. Actually, they were turning the world right side up. And when you get to Hebrews chapter 11, it, it's the roll call of the hall of faith and it talks about Abraham and Enoch. And, um, and then when you get later in the chapter, it's talking about Moses. And then he says, time would fail me to tell you of Samson and Barak and Jephthah and David and all these people that subdued kingdoms and received promises. And, and they did great things in the kingdom of God. And I've been hearing lately, and I've, I'm in total agreement with this. I didn't say this first, but I'm going to say it now. The first century world needed a first century church. The first century world was a pre-Christian world. There was no reference point. When, when someone started talking to them about Jesus, there's no internet, there's no newspapers, there's, there's no uh, you know, mass communication network and so when, when they went out everywhere, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. When they went to preach the gospel, their people had no reference point for what they were talking about. And in our day and age, it's getting easier and easier to find people. When you talk about Jesus, they have no idea what you're talking about. They don't know what church is. They don't know that Jesus died on a cross for our sins. They don't know that God raised him from the dead and that he's alive. They don't know any of that stuff. The first century world needed a first century church that had the manifestation of God in it and in the lives of the believers. That was the only thing that was going to uh, crash through and make the gospel different than every other philosophy and good teaching and all that stuff that was uh, available in their day. And so we're just going to, uh, I have a lesson somewhere that I've taught about the five calls of God. 
And so this, some of this is from that. And in the five calls of God, the five calls are, the first one is a universal call to salvation. That's universal to everybody. The second call of God is the call to sanctification. That's a universal call. God wants us to sanctify ourselves. The third uh, call of God is the call to serve. Those are three universal calls. Then there's a fourth call of God that's a call to vocational ministry. That's not necessarily for everybody. And then there's the fifth call, which I don't recommend that you go looking for it, but God has called upon certain people to suffer. And like I say, I don't recommend you go looking for that. It's like praying for patience. Just skip over that, okay? Just learn to develop patience on your own without God having to help, you, help us, okay? But the, the universal call to salvation is a universal call because we are universally lost. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We all turn to our own way. Romans 3, 23, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 6, 23, says the wages of our sin is death. That's the separation from God. When God told Adam and Eve in the garden, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. And the devil comes along, and what does he do? He messes with the message. And so he says, oh, you're not going to die. God just knows that when you eat of that fruit, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to be smart like him. And it's amazing that not only have we become smart like him, most people that I've met are smarter than God. If you don't believe me, just ask them. Or just look at how, look at how people live. We live like we're smarter than God. God said this is the way to do it. And the majority of humanity is saying, well, I'm smarter than that. I can do a better job than that. Not so. The wages of sin is death. When Adam and Eve ate of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, something in them died, and they became separated from God. When God came around and wanted to get close to them, they hid themselves. So the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9, and 10, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you ever get a chance to lead someone to Christ, don't, don't pray for them. Don't do the praying for them. It says with, with the mouth confession. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, yes, I accept Christ as my Lord. God is voice actuated, right? He's not thought actuated generally. He's voice actuated, okay? 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say we have no sin, see, we're, we're preaching the gospel to people, we're saying we need to confess our sins and confess the Lord Jesus as our Savior. Well, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. In Acts 2, 21, it shall come to pass that whosoever, and there's a whole lot more to this uh, 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 universal call of salvation. I'm just giving you a, little, a couple of highlights. Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is a universal call to salvation. Whosoever will. And this is God's ministry to me. God's ministry to me is offering me a free salvation. Now, most people in life will tell, oh, nothing's free. No such thing as a free lunch. Nothing is free. Well, you can't earn this. You cannot earn God's favor or God's love. I'm driving down the road the other day. I'm looking out at the sky, and I'm saying, man, God, how do you, how do you even love me? You know, I'm, and, you know I'm, my brain is running a million miles a minute. It always does. And then I'm, then I'm going to, well, God, you, you don't even love me for me because of me. You love me because of you. You know, I don't have anything that's lovable about me. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He doesn't love me because of me. He doesn't love you because of you, because of anything you've done. He loves you because God is love. And he manifests his love through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for our sins. So the next call of God is really a call of separation. See, God ministers to me, 
and it brings salvation to me. That's his ministry to me. Now, what happens when that salvation comes to my life? And I think it was, uh, oh, I can't even think of the name now. I got so many of them old preachers, old time preachers uh, rattling around in my head. Uh, I think it was Tozer, A.W. Tozer. He says that the, uh, the problem with uh, the church is, and in his day, they had problems just like we do, is that people are not being thoroughly converted. Or David Wilkerson called it, I think he has a sermon called, The Church of Forgiveness Only. We want to wear the name tag and have forgiveness of sin, but we don't really want to change. You know, God gave me a little illustration about that one time. I should probably just reserve this story for Bible college students, but here you go. So the phone rings at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, sometimes my alarm goes off in the morning and I'm trying to answer my phone. Who's calling me? You know, you're all sleepy and everything. You finally answer the phone. Pastor Al, Pastor Al, I need you, I need you. Please, it's an emergency. You have to come right now. Oh, get out of bed, get dressed, put my jacket on, get in the car, drive over there. And they fling the door open. Oh, yes, yes, come, come, come on, come on. The problem's right here, right here. They take you down the hallway and they open the door and it's the bathroom. And the toilet's overflowed. And there's stuff everywhere. Pastor, you're the only one that can fix this for us. So take my coat off, roll up my sleeve, get down on my knees in front of the toilet, I put my hand down in there, and, go, and they go, oh, there it is, I got it. And about time you grab the problem, someone smacks you with a frying pan, don't touch that! A lot of people just want their problem solved. They, don't, uh, they, they, want, they want their mess cleaned up. They don't necessarily want the problem fixed, Okay. So most of us at some point have probably been to some smaller degree guilty of that. We, we want our mess cleaned up, but we don't necessarily want to forsake the issues that are causing the problems. But when God brings salvation to me, Leviticus 20, 26, when I found this Bible, Bible verse years ago, it, it just had a major impact on my life. God said to them, now, these people have just come out of 400 years of slavery, or thereabouts. They didn't start out as slaves, but they spent the majority of their time uh, in bondage to the Egyptians. They have no concept of being separate and holy unto God. They know they have some kind of a heritage through Abraham, uh, but they're, they're just they're lost people. Their, their reference point in life is being a slave. And God brings them out, and they're in the wilderness, and he's establishing a religious order of how his people are going to worship and serve him. And one of the things he says in Leviticus towards the end of setting up this religion that's called Judaism, there's only two religions, by the way, that God acknowledges in all the whole planet or history of the human race, Judaism and Christianity. You Google religions, and there's thousands and thousands of religions out there. God only recognizes Judaism and Christianity. And right now, Judaism is on hold. Christianity is the only thing that God recognizes right now because that demands an answer to the sacrifice of his son. But I'm kind of getting sidetracked there. He said, you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have severed you from other people that you should be mine. And the reason that verse impacted me so, so much is because when I got saved, I instantly felt severed from all the other people. I didn't really know any Christians. I'd seen a couple guys around the base that packed Bibles, but I, I wasn't traveling in those circles. And so I, I immediately felt severed from the people that I ran with. Immediately, I'm not like them. There's something different now. And so he says to be holy to me. To be holy, that the word scares a lot of people. Holiness. To be holy scares a lot of people. Now our idea of holiness now is 
uh, you don't do certain things. You don't drink, smoke, chase, cuss, or chew. And then there's a lot of other things, you know, that um, back around the early 20th century, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, you had the holiness preachers, and women didn't wear makeup, no jewelry. I, I don't know what they had for the men, but they sure were hard on the ladies. And that's not holiness. That's not what it means to be holy. The word holy means to be set apart or consecrated for a single use. When you, when you read about the Old Testament temple as it's being uh, built, even the tabernacle in the wilderness, God's giving them the blueprints and the instructions on how to build this and build that and the furnishings. And each of those furnishings had a specific use. It was created and formed or built for a certain thing, and you didn't use it for anything else. That's what it means. He said, this is holy unto me. It's consecrated for this purpose. So to be holy unto the Lord doesn't mean that we have to be perfect and without sin. That's what scares most people about the word holy, that we ought to be holy like God. All God's saying when he says, I'm holy, he's not saying I'm perfect and without sin, which he is. He's not saying that we have to be that like him. He's saying God is holy in the, in the fact that he has a single purpose. God only has one purpose, and that's to manifest himself to his creation, his true self. Ephesians 3, verse 10 and 11, that God is going to reveal his manifold wisdom to the principalities and powers, which is all those invisible beings out there, by the church. By the plan of salvation and the plan of redemption, when this is all played out, God will have manifested himself for who he really is. Because you, nobody can know who he really is because he's infinite in time and space and volume and he's invisible. Now, how are you going to know, how are you going to know that person? Well, you know people by observing how they react act and react in a variety of situations over and over and over and over again. See, if you observe me one time doing something good, you can say, oh, Pastor Al's a pretty good guy, but you might have just caught me on a good day. <laughs> I, all my days are not good days, okay? If you see me doing something not so good, you say, Pastor Al's a dirty, rotten scoundrel, but you might have just caught me on a bad day. See? Not all my days are bad days. Not all my days are good days. But when you observe God in, in his whole scope of history with the human race, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never has bad days or good days. They're all the same days because his nature is steady as a rock. God is love. He was loved yesterday. He's going to be loved today. He's going to be loved tomorrow. God is holy and righteous. He doesn't change. He has a single purpose. He's compassionate. He's merciful. All of those things, he is all the time. He doesn't, he doesn't change them up. So when he says, I have severed you from all the peoples of the earth, I've, I cut you out from the herd. And if you want to know what that means, go home. Don't do it now on your phone. But when you get home or get to the restaurant today, go on YouTube and, and search cutting horses. It's a thing of beauty to watch cutting horse competition because that horse, they, they pick out a calf or a steer out of a little herd and they cut it out and they try to keep it from getting back over there. It's just, it's really something to watch. God says, I cut you out from the herd. Don't be trying to go back, okay? Don't be, okay, don't be trying to get back over there. He has separated us for a single use and purpose. What is the single use and purpose that he has separated us from all the peoples of the earth for? The same single use purpose that, his, that he's destined for, and that's to reveal him to his creation. God wants to live in me to the point where I become a revelation of him to his creation. The Israelites, they're just learning what it means to come out of slavery and to become people of purpose and destiny. See, God didn't save me so I could now get back on the rail that I got derailed from by sin. 
See, we have dreams and we have visions and things that we're going to do with our life. And for some of us, sin had just twisted us all up and, and we had a wreck. And so when God saves me and heals me and delivers me, he doesn't put me back on that rail and send me back, keep on going the direction I was going. He puts me on a whole different track. And that different track is not my will, but his will. It's, it's living for him. So God separates us. He hallows us. He purifies us by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, most people use these verses uh, to teach on marriage. But at the end of the discourse, Paul says, I'm really talking about Christ and the church. How he washes us, sanctifies us, and cleanses us by the washing of water of the word. That he separates me. These things that he does to me make me different than all the peoples of the earth. When my friend said the next day or a few days later when I finally started seeing some of them again, hey Al, come on man, we're going to go have a beer or we're going to go do something else. And I said, no nah, man, that's not me. Oh, come on, one beer won't hurt you. I didn't have a good answer for that. So I just said, no, it's not good for you, though. Because if I have one beer, you know that and we all, none of us ever stop with one. And it's just not good for you to see me do that. I didn't even, I, I didn't even know I was that smart. That must have been the Holy Ghost coming out of me. <laughs> okay? Jesus sanctifies us. He sets us apart through his own blood. The blood of Christ is what separates me from the rest of the world. We're set apart for a purpose and a destiny in him. And this is what I call, I don't know if I got this from somewhere or if, if, if I call it this, but I call it positional sanctification. This is how God sees me. God sees me through the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? When, I'm, when I sin, he sees me through the blood of Christ. I see myself as condemned, I'm going to hell now, ah, you know, all the stuff that you wrestle with, but that's not true. I am a child of God. I'm washed in the blood of Jesus. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, Christians who sin, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So now that this is how God sees me as his child, as his, uh, we're betrothed to him as his bride. Most people that have been a Christian very long, you understand that the church is the bride of Christ, or the, the future bride of Christ. So now we have the responsibility to act like a faithful bride, right? So God sees all of our potential and desires us to inherit. He wants to live us to live in a way that's going to help us live out his call on our life. You know, when we do baby dedications here, you know, those are, you know, to some people it's just, oh, I get my kid dedicated, you know, it's, it's what we do. But a baby dedication at the end of the, of the prayer time, before we give the baby back to the parents, we, we, we charge them that there's no magic in these words. There's no magic prayer that you can say over a kid that will make everything turn out all right. And the charge is, that as parents, we do the best we can to live a life that will help God answer that prayer. Because it's not a magic prayer just because we said it. We're believing that God's going to help us on this journey. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him, that's Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is how God sees you. If you're a born-again Christian today, God sees you as righteous in the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're not born again today, there's no amount of good you can do that will eradicate the sin that you have done. And if you say you haven't sinned, the Bible says, I'm not saying this, the Bible says you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. That's what God says. So we, we are made righteous by the blood of Christ. And so where are we going with this? All this is headed for Daniel 11:32. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, I printed it out here for you. But the people who know their God will be strong and carry out great exploits. God's not interested in us just living life as a couch potato Christian 
or living on the internet, uh, you know, listening to, and I hate to say this because now I am an internet preacher. We have a YouTube channel. Our messages go up on YouTube every week. New Life 530. But it's not for the world. It's for, it came about because of COVID. I never actually wanted to be online. But sometimes things, it necessitates it. But God wants us to be people of action. The first century church was the response to the first century culture. The first century culture was pre-Christian. They had no reference point for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the church had to have power because everybody's got an argument, everybody's got a philosophy, everybody's got an idea. Everybody. But Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And it says, when they took off preaching the gospel, the Lord worked with them, confirming the word with signs following. Now we live in a post-Christian world, which is much the same as the pre-Christian world. Everybody's got a philosophy. Everybody's got an idea. Everybody's got an opinion. By the way, the real American Idol. Remember the show American Idol? The real American Idol is my opinion. Don't touch my opinion. We're going to have a problem. But my opinion is mine. And if I think this is the way it is, and that's the way it is. Hey, God wants us to carry out exploits. Now look at the bottom of page two. Most people, know, some of you don't know this, epoxy, epoxy cement or glue has two parts to make it work. You got the glue and you got the hardener. Uh, anybody ever played with vinegar and baking soda when you were a kid? Separately? Nothing. You put them together, you get a reaction, okay? Anybody done this or watched the videos where they put the Mentos in the Pepsi bottle <laughs> or Coke? Okay, you get the picture here? It, 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 it's a two-part two uh, journey. If I'm going to walk in the call of God in my life and inherit all the blessings and the potential that he has for me, I have to come into agreement with that calling. I have to come into agreement with his severing or separating me from the world. I don't think my pastor ever preached a sermon. I can't remember a sermon he ever preached that he didn't use 1 John 2.15. Don't love the world. Don't love the things that are in the world. Everything that's in the world, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, that's of the world. It's not of the Father. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. It doesn't mean that God wants to put you in a straitjacket and you don't have any fun. Hey, I had a lot of fun going up to Collins Lake with my grandson and another brother from the church. And we went up there and we went to a men's fellowship outing. And we went fishing in the boat and we uh, barbecued. I didn't barbecue, but I got to partake of barbecued hamburgers and hot dog and potato salad and all that. We had a lot of fun. Didn't we have fun? God, God's not wanting you to live a life where you don't have any fun. He wants us to be salt and light. And... When you're having fun, you can be salt and light, okay? So we have to come into agreement. And all this so far was my introduction. Here's the, here's the message, okay? The power of agreement. A lot of people have written books and uh, preached sermons about if two agree on anything, it's going to be done, and the power of agreement. Well, the first thing I need to agree with is God's calling to sanctification on my life. That's the first thing I need to agree with. Then I can begin to do exploits and do the things that look like a set-apart life. Jeremy was telling me about a fellow he worked with, and the guy got called to jury duty. And you know, um, when they start interviewing the potential jurors, they start asking you questions. And the question came up with something about... Um, do you drink or have you ever drank alcohol or something like that? And, and the brother said, no. That'll get somebody's eyebrows up out, out in the world. No. Actually, in the church it will too sometimes. And he said, no. And so the, the lawyer said, is that 
for religious reasons or personal reasons? And he said, yes. There you go. I choose to live a set-apart life. If I drink a beer, am I going to go to hell? Probably not. Well, I don't, know if I, I don't know if I will or not. But if I go to heaven and I'm living like the world, there's a pretty good chance I won't take anybody with me, even my own kids. God calls us to live a set-apart life. In Acts 26, 20, it says that to turn to God and do works that look like repentance. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, come out from among them and be separate. Romans 12, 1 and 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I can't renew my mind if I'm putting the same old stuff in there. I've got to start putting new stuff in there and start reprogramming how I think to get my stinking thinking out and to get my God thinking in. My pastor used to walk around here. I don't know. He had kind of a square head. So he could, he could balance that on his head. My pastor used to walk up and down by this altar praying in the spirit with his Bible on top of his head. <laughs> Getting God thoughts in there. Reading and studying the scriptures. Focusing on my ministry. If you're born again, God's called you to ministry. <laughs> Salvation is God's ministry to me. Living a separated life is my ministry to the world. Because that's what they need to see, something with hope and light in it. Christians don't seek sin, but sin seeks the Christian. So we have to do what Paul said, die daily to our old nature. So I want you to circle this. If you haven't written on your notes at all, number one, we cannot outmuscle that old man. So you have to outrun him. You can't outmuscle. The Bible talks about the flesh being the strong man. You can't take your strong man and try to subdue the strong man. It just doesn't work. You can't do it. The old man, and I, I teach this in Bible college, the old man is never so dead he can't be resurrected on a moment's notice. It's true. Doesn't matter how saved and sanctified and Holy Ghost filled you are, you let somebody slip into that parking place as you're just starting to turn your steering wheel and see what happens. That old man will rise up and you're in a wrestling match. Okay? So you can't outmuscle him, you have to outrun him. You run to Jesus, you run with Christians. Galatians 5.16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In Romans 8, it says, if you mind, or that means to tend, the things of the Spirit, you will walk in life. If you, if you give your attention and your focus to the things of the flesh, you're going to die. Okay? You, you can't, you can't out-muscle this guy. We just don't spend your time wrestling like that. You outrun him. You run with the scriptures. You run with the spirit. You run with Christians. Mark Anderson told me the night I got saved, he said, if you want to be a Christian in five years from now, you need to do three things. Learn how to pray and talk to God. Get a relationship going. Read your Bible. Start filling your mind with God's thoughts. And the third thing was, he said, go wherever Christians go. And he had a, a, a 71 or 72 Dodge Dart, 318, Gear reduction starter. They got a sound all their own. And my room was 101 downstairs at the end of the barracks. And his car parked on the street right there. Uh, and when I would hear that uh, Dodge Dart start up, I'd run out and jump in the seat and say, where are we going? And about nine times out of ten, it was here or wherever these people were, group, were congregating at. Going, run, run with the Bible. Run with Christians. Run in the Spirit. Living my set-apart life is the hope for the lost souls of the whole world. We, we are the hope that they're looking for. In Matthew 5, verse 13, we're the salt of the earth. We're a city on a hill. In 1 Peter 3, 15, Peter says, always be ready to give an answer to a person who will ask you about your hope. What? What? Why would somebody ask me about my hope? 
because I carry myself and act like a person who's got hope that's not in this world. Because when the people are running around saying the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and you look up and the sky is indeed falling. You say, I don't care. That's not where my hope is at. My hope is in my salvation. It's in the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of my sins, and the hope of eternal life because everybody's going to die. Nobody gets out of here alive. That's just how it is. Nobody, we're not going to get out of here alive. So where's our hope? How, how you leave here, whether the sky falls on you, or a truck falls on you, or a mass shooting, or a heart attack, or other health issues, it doesn't matter how we get out of here. God's program is to get humans from earth to heaven. God's program is to get people involved with the plan of salvation and redemption. That's his plan. Because as that plan unfolds, it brings the revelation of who he really is. If I, just, if I still looked and acted like I did the day before I got saved, or maybe even the day after I got saved, I'm not sure. How, how would my testimony of a changed life be any, have any power or any effect? It, it wouldn't. Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Do all things without complaining and disputing. In other words, do everything with peace. Be peaceful. And as the world is falling apart, as you know, our streets literally at any moment can erupt in violence, mass violence across this nation. I see in the news they're already... Uh, protesting at Catholic churches back east and in the larger cities, New York and other places, uh, uh, protesting because of potentially what might be coming down from the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, justices, many of them, their houses are being uh, targeted now, their homes. They have no safety or sanctuary in their own homes. And all of this could just explode across this nation at any one moment. I would not have been surprised to see people show up here to protest at our church today. I said, man, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen at New Life today. I don't know. But you know what? My hope isn't in all that stuff. I've got the peace of God that passes all understanding. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. And when you do it peacefully, when you do all things with peace in your heart, not complaining and disputing. We've got a lot of things to complain about. If you just look around, there's a lot of things you can find to complain about. And without disputing, there's a lot of things to argue about. Some people want uh, Roe v. Wade overturned. Some people don't. Some people want things to go this way. Some people want things to go. There's always things that we can argue about and dispute. Paul says, don't do that. Live in peace. In Romans I think it's 12, he says, as much as depends on you, as much as is in you, live at peace with all men. Okay? And when we do that, then we become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. There it is. To shine as lights in the world. God has severed, if you're born again, God has severed you from the peoples of the earth. You're not like the world anymore. You can go back and try to find your place again, but it won't be the same. You can go down to the river and put your finger in there, and when you pull it out, the hole is gone. It's gone. There's no place. There's no place found where your finger was. There's no place to, for it to go back to. You're, you're separated from the world. Now, when we start living a separated, consecrated life to Jesus, we become lights that shine in a crooked and perverse generation. We become lights in the world. And first, uh, first Kings chapter 19, this is my all-time favorite story in the whole Bible. Oops, where am I? First Kings 19. In verse King, uh, first Kings 19, God is speaking to Elijah. You know, he was on the run. He went and hid out in the cave. And, and uh, finally, the still, small voice got his attention. And God began to give him some instructions. In verse 16, he said, Also, you, uh, you shall anoint uh, 
Jehu, son of Nimshi, is king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And then in verse 19, it says, So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the twelfth. Uh, then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And I don't know what a prophet's mantle looked like in those days, but there was something, uh, a shoulder uh, coat or uh, a shawl or something that identified the prophets of God. And when people saw that, when the Israelites saw that, they knew who they were dealing with. And Elijah went by Elisha, who's plowing out in the field with a yoke of oxen, and he walks by and he takes his mantle off and he throws it on that guy and he just keeps walking. Verse 20. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah, and he said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said, Well, go ahead. What, 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 have, what have I done to you? <laughs> Don't mess with me. You know what you did to me. You know what you did to me. I was, I was using these verses down in uh, Cristo Vive in Mexico uh, years ago, and uh, uh, Lee and April were pioneered that church, and they were growing a church in Ensenada, and their, their uh, associate pastor's helper were Jaime and Clarissa. And after the service, Jaime went up to Lee, and he said, that's what you did to me. Jaime owned a stationery store. He's a businessman. He said, you walked into my stationery store, and you threw your mantle on me and walked out, and I was changed. It, it works. God wants to put his mantle on you this morning. And then when the mantle came on him, verse 21, so Elisha turned back from him, took a yoke of oxen, and killed them. He, he obviously was the owner of this operation, or at least his family was, because you don't go around killing other people's oxen. He slaughtered them and boiled their flesh. He, he, he chopped up the, the yoke and the plow and the implements to use for wood to barbecue this, this, these oxen and have a celebration about the call of God. And they ate it, and then it says, Then he rose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Now i got to get my computer here and read you something. Come on, computer. There we go. William Borden, he's heir to the Borden Dairy Fortune, was born in 1887 to one of the wealthiest, most, pow most powerful families in Chicago. In 1904, William Borden graduated from a Chicago high school. As heir to the Borden Dairy Estate, he was already a millionaire. For his high school graduation pre present, his parents gave the 16-year-old Borden a trip around the world. As the young man traveled through Asia, the Middle East, and Europe, he felt a growing burden for the world's hurting people. Finally, Bill Borden wrote home about his desire to be a missionary. One friend expressed surprise that he was throwing himself away as a missionary. In response, Bill wrote two words in the back of his Bible. No reserves. During his college years, Bill Borden made one entry uh, in his personal journey that defined what his classmates were seeing in him. The entry simply said, say no to self and yes to Jesus every time. Upon graduating from Yale, Borden turned down some high-paying job offers as well as offers to pastor churches. In his Bible, he wrote two more words, no retreat. Borden went on to graduate work at Princeton Seminary in New Jersey. When he finished his studies at Princeton, he sailed for China. Because he was hoping to work with Muslims, he stopped first in Egypt to study Arabic. While there, he contracted spinal meningitis. Within a month, 25-year-old William Borden was dead. While on his deathbed, he wrote two final words in his Bible. No regrets. No regrets. 
a person who's been separated by God through the blood of Jesus and says yes to Jesus and lives a separated life will not live a life of regret. The sorriest people in this planet are people who have had an experience with Jesus Christ and have said, I'm still going to do my own thing. I'm, gonna, I'm smarter than God. I'm going to do it my way. And they're going to live a life of regret. Bill Borden had no regrets. He took up the mantle of the cross and took it to the world as far, and I promise you that all the way along, he was being a testimony and a light for Jesus. He wasn't like, well, someday I'm going to do something great for God, and I'm going to get over to Egypt and China and, and do something for the Lord. He was doing something for God every single day. He was living a separated life. God separated him to the gospel. And if you're born again, he separated you from the gospel. And this is, this is your ministry. It's my ministry to the world. My ministry to the world isn't what I do in this pulpit. My ministry to the world is what I do out there. I live a light, live a life to, to try to be a light, to shine in the darkness. A word, the Bible says, spoken in due season that ministers grace to the hearer. A person who looks like something that has hope to people who have no hope. And this morning, I, I can tell you that at some point in this worship service coming up, that, that my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will come along right beside you and he'll just put his mantle on you. Many of you, he already has. We just need to walk into agreement and say, yes, Lord, I agree with your call in my life. I'm going to walk it out. I'm going to be salt and light. I'm going to be ready to give an answer to anybody that I can slow down long enough to listen to me. Amen? Glory to God. Lord, thank you.